thanks in advance for um, your efforts so far, but more importantly, your efforts in what may be coming. Um, you've all seen the news from Italy and Spain and Germany to a lesser extent, and Iran and China, and now New York, and maybe Washington and San Francisco. Uh, and it's playing out like some kind of bad B-rate movie. Um, Ontario has done some pretty aggressive things, which we hope will lead to fewer infections. But what you're gonna hear today is how the hospitals are planning for what's potentially coming and, and some of the background work that's been done and, and where we could be in a, in a period of days or weeks. Again, somebody's not muted. Please make sure you mute yourself just to avoid feedback. Um, I'll kick off by asking Barry if he could present first. And Barry, if you can just ask me to um, um, move the slides forward when, you, uh, when you're when you ready for it. Thanks, Mark. Uh, go ahead, next one. Uh, so guys, um, you all know that that the amount of work that's been going on is 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 staggering. Uh, it, the amount that's been accomplished has been uh, heroic, uh, and I want to add my thanks to everybody who has uh, stepped up uh, and um, applause to the to the frontline staff at the hospitals who uh, just keep working their way through all of this. Um, what I'm going to show you is. Are, we have been very busy. The, um, it hasn't hit the fan yet. Uh, and it, we've probably got about another 10 days uh, before the first part of the tsunami arrives. And maybe, as you'll see, uh, another month after that before the, 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 it sort of washes over top of us. Next slide, Mark. Uh, we have a structure uh, within uh, HHS, and St. Joe's has a similar structure, which Alistair may want to comment on. Uh, there are um, there is a central command, uh, and out of that central command, there are at least um, a dozen uh, various working groups and several uh, specific task forces that are reporting to the central command every day at noon. And one of those. Uh, is chaired by Cheryl Williams, who is the new VP at, uh, at the General, and uh, Khaled is the, um, the co-chair of that. Uh, Khaled may join the call and will uh, help me if I screw this up. But what you're seeing on this slide is um, some expected admissions uh, and transfers. Uh, and, and basically what this says is that uh, there will be a 10% clinical attack rate in the community. That's not the number of people who will be uh, infected. It's the number of people who will be clinically unwell. 20% of those people will uh, be admitted. One third will end up in ICU. And of those who go to ICU, half will die. So what you're seeing there in the red box is, is week four of when the tsunami begins to arrive. We're at probably week minus two uh, at this point. And so uh, unadjusted uh, is assuming that, that um, you know, that, that, that the various measures are uh, ineffective or not very effective and adjusted assumes that uh, we can reduce the uh, impact by the measures that have been undertaken by 50%. So uh, on week four, which probably is six weeks from now, we are estimating with luck somewhere between 79 and 91 admissions per day for COVID positive patients. Uh, the 79 is the start of week one and 91 is the end. Uh, 24 to 26 ICU admissions per day. Uh, transfers it from the ward to ICU uh, of 7 to 12. Uh, and you'll see there are very few who go back from ICU to the wards. Um, so uh, like that, that's where we are thinking. Next slide, Mark. This is Hamilton uh, uh, estimates of the impact. Um, adjusted is the, the dotted lines and the orange line, the horizontal orange line looks at current beds, and then you'll see 
uh, that there are various further lines related to the institution's ability to find extra beds and places to put people. Uh, and the, the obvious implication here is that, um, sorry, thanks Mark, that uh, you know, with some luck, we will be able to somehow find enough beds uh, to just barely cope if we're successful in flattening the curve. Uh, and that assumes that we would have uh, somewhere around 900 extra beds in, uh, in the operation. I can tell you that at HHS, we actually have 250 less patients in the institution than we had three weeks ago. And that reflects the fact that nobody will come to the ED uh, together with the effects of canceling all elective surgery and so on. But 250 is nothing compared to uh, the, the kind of numbers that you see there. Uh, next slide, Mark. This is the equivalent in ICU. And um, you know, there's lots of opportunities to argue with this, uh, but you know, even, even if we're um, half right on the adjusted, we got, we got big trouble. So next slide. So what's happening uh, at the capacity task force is uh, people uh, are very, very diligently looking for every opportunity for a place to put a patient, every opportunity for a place to put an ICU patient, and all of the necessary um, pieces that would be responsible to do that in terms of physical capacity. What's not yet here, and we've all seen a little bit of this work, uh, and we've talked about it, is what the manpower uh, requirements would be should we arrive at the kind of scenarios that you're seeing. So Dr. Stacy and Dave and Russell have uh, asked those of us in GIM, critical care and ED to provide them with a very clear um, manpower plan to deal with these kinds of levels of uh, capacity. And it's my opinion that we're currently sort of stage one and a half and yeah we're okay for now and we'll be able to cope uh, to go up to you know about 130 patients as opposed to the current 75 at the JH and similar numbers at the general and after that the current model of GIM will not be sustainable and as Lori is going to tell you residents are not going to be able to carry this ball. So it, it's my opinion that uh, we were going to need, and you've heard a little bit about this, but I think it's now come home to roost. We are going to need every member, uh, able-bodied uh, member of the department to be part of this solution. And I believe it will need to be a 24-7 uh, shift model to be able to begin to cope with this kind of, uh, of work. And it's not gonna last a day or a week. So, I, I sound like um, Chicken Little because I'm kind of getting to that point uh, and I just wanted to lay it out that, in, in, that we are going to be asking everybody to tell us uh, what their level of skills are. You may have seen an email from my office and Alistair's office and you should anticipate that um, uh, you, you will see yourself on a schedule. Uh, and we will be in a cir circumstance where we will suddenly need to say we are activating stage three and the schedule that exists now says that uh, that Dr. Lum is scheduled to be on the ward uh, from uh, 6, 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, to provide care for X patients and I think with that is the reality if we're going to survive this. So I'll stop. Thanks Mark. Sorry, I was talking to a muted microphone. Just to reiterate, Barry said, you know, this is, this is something we haven't faced in 101 years since the Spanish flu came by and is going to require a truly Herculean effort on everybody's part. There's been an immense amount of planning going on in the background to figure all this out. Um, I'll maybe ask um, Alistair, or Alistair, if you could unmute yourself if you're online and just to present the St. Joe's uh, figures. Hi, Mark, can everybody hear me? Yes. Great. So um, 
So uh, just a few things. I'm not going to reiterate a lot of what Barry said. Uh, what I will say is that the estimates are very preliminary at this point. Uh, and I just received into my hands today an estimate from public health done today that shows that the impact may be less than feared. But again, uh, that is all very preliminary stuff. Uh, I think obviously it behooves us to plan for, uh, you know, perhaps not the worst case scenario, but certainly we shouldn't be planning for the best case scenario. We don't want to be Pollyanna-ish about this. Um, but you'll see these numbers refine, obviously, as we go forward. Uh, every day that passes, public health and the hospitals are able to refine the numbers uh, a little bit more. Um, St. Joseph's also has a surge plan. I won't bore you with it. There are currently 100 beds open in the hospital, uh, as like with HHS, and we have another 145 that we can use for um, uh, such patients. Uh, so really 250 beds that uh, we can make available for, um, uh, the, um, uh, for uh, COVID-19 patients. Uh, we, uh, our projections, uh, our, our, our worst case projections would indicate we might get there, but certainly from what I've seen from public health today, I have, I'm somewhat more optimistic. Um, I have taken the liberty uh, and have not received too much blowback of rating all members of the medical staff here in their ability to function in places like the ICU, the ER, and the GIM ward. Uh, nobody has been too offended. Uh, my secretary and Kimmy Rolfe, who everybody at St. Joe's knows, uh, will be putting together essentially a dominoes falling call schedule that uh, will take into account your level of expertise uh, and the patient um, flow and patient pressures in the hospital, uh, which would lead to uh, you know the calls going out. So similar to uh, HHS. Uh, I think the other big thing that has come up, uh, oh, and one other thing at St. Joe's, I don't know if Barry can speak to this at HHS, but one thing we're doing and hope to finish by the end of this week uh, is to clarify precisely on the ward who has this problem. Uh, so people will not be leaving the emergency department till we know whether they're COVID positive or negative. So we're expanding the emergency department to be able to accommodate that. And all individuals who have been in the hospital for more than a week, uh, those who have been in for less than a week have already been tested, but for more than a week we're going to be testing them as well. So we, we will know where all the COVID positive and co who's COVID positive and who's negative before they come upstairs. Okay? And that's going to be important, I think, for the PPE piece, which is probably the piece that a lot of people here really want to hear about and I think gives a lot of us concern. So this is really changing from day to day, all right? And I think people are going to have to beg a little bit of forbearance on this. Uh, we hope to come to a conclusion on this by the end of this week, but it is very much a moving target. Uh, I'm just looking at the Toronto Region COVID-19 Hospital Operations Table Guidelines that went out yesterday. They were changed from previous, but they are now recommending two procedure masks per day for healthcare workers that interact with patients who are not in the high risk areas, i.e. the ICU, the ED, or the COVID-19 ward. Um, so, you know, it is quite likely that we will be going along the same way. We are fortunate in that the modeling from public health indicates we're quite some time behind Toronto in terms of community transmission. Uh, so we have a bit of time to button this down and sort it out. Uh, there is not a sur great surplus of PPE. I think everybody understands that. Uh, we're continuing to receive deliveries as per usual, uh, but if we start just handing it out willy-nilly, we will run out and fairly quickly. Mohawk Hospital Services has indicated today that they have had some luck with uh, suppliers in China. Apparently, ma really substantial new supply chains are up and running in China now. And it is the hope that there will be a lot more PPE in two to three weeks, which looking at the public health modeling here for Hamilton looks pretty good as long as we keep doing our social distancing. Uh, but again, uh, you know, I, I really I'm going to have to beg forbearance on the PPE issue for a couple of more days uh, till uh, the hospitals land on a place uh, with this. And I'm hoping I, th I think that both hospital corporations will land in the same place. That's all I have to say for now. Uh, thanks, Alistair. Maybe I'll ask um, 
Lori, um, to make a few comments from the resident perspective, if you can hear me, Lori. We can't hear you, Lori, if you're speaking. Are you unmuted? Let me just have a look here and see. Oh, yeah, pardon me. I got it now. Do, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so as others have stated, we're working hard to make sure that we uh, address all of the service gaps and service issues with this very much moving target that we're seeing from day by day. Um, I would say right now we're looking at approximately 22 residents per day who are not able to um, participate in clinical duties because they're off for various reasons. So that leaves us in internal medicine with a workforce of about 198 to 100 people. Um, I've been very fortunate to have the assistance of Marianne Tallman and Leslie Martin who have taken on the huge task of looking at um, the resident scheduling. So they've completely taken that over and are managing things at all three sites. Furthermore, uh, Leslie, Jan and I had some meetings, had a meeting or so this afternoon to look at how we're gonna proceed um, as we approach what's most likely to be an escalating situation. Um, and we've sort of divided things into phases. Uh, so far, we've got three phases lined up. We are currently right now in phase A, which means that we're under some sort of fortification scheme with our scheduling to make sure that all the gaps are filled. Our residents are each doing more call. We have backup call and uh, there's at least two residents on at night that are assigned a backup call and they have been used quite frequently and are being used a bit more, which means that we may be running a bit low on resident reserves, not quite yet, but we are certainly getting there. Um, we have also tried to keep residents um, confined or more cohorted with one site so that there's not a lot of cross transmission from one site to the next. That's not always possible. We're aiming for that. On the CTUs, we're down to having the, the, the staff on each team being an SMR and two juniors rather than our usual three juniors. So those are the things that we've done in this first phase that we've called phase A. Um, the second phase we feel will likely start in block 11, which is in just a week or so. Um, and that's going to be gearing up a little bit. And what we're going to plan to do is to equalize and assign the residents to more or less stay at one site of the three sites. So uh, that means that team C at Jurovinsky will reopen. So we'll try to keep a stable number of residents at each site. Um, as well, we may need to um, look at some other strategies. Um, at that time as well to make things work. I think that, you know, backup call will continue. Um, I anticipate that as there's more cases and more residents go off ill that we'll have to um, probably call in other services um, to help. The GIM um, residents uh, through Raj Maya's leader have um, agreed to come and help with our IM resident workforce and that's very much appreciated. The third phase will be enacted once we hear from the hospitals, once we get the trigger from the hospitals, or once we notice that we're um, out of staff, um, we will at that point probably blow up the entire call system and the CTU um, system as we know it. And we have some preliminary ideas about how that would happen as well. Um, so, you know, we, we don't want to plan too far ahead, but we will be putting more time in on it. I think Marianne, unless you're meeting later tonight to try to, to to maybe look at that little more detail at the third phase, uh, phase C. So what we know for sure is that we will run out of resident support. Um, we're going to try to do this whole thing, of course, by maintaining some component of educational mandate, um, but service will take priority when things get really hot. Uh, we would ask the, that the faculty continue to try to provide evaluations for residents because it's very important to get those evaluations in order for them to get credit. Otherwise, they're going, to go off, they're going to go off cycle and delay completing their program. But they will be there to help for service. But I can say that we will not have enough residents to cover. We will need to use other resources, which will be faculty. And I'm sure also, I don't know if anyone's addressed earlier, I don't think so, the deployment plan with Section 77.7 .7 from the Chief Medical Officer of Health. And that is what the hospitals under the Health Promotion and Protection Act or will be following. Postgrad also has a redeployment policy that will be sort of working um, with, with the programs themselves and um, also collaborating with the hospitals um, so that we can engage other workers in the resident side at least um, and faculty I'm sure will also be happening 
in order to make sure that all services um, are covered. So again, I will thank everyone uh, for their participation and um, much admiration for the faculty and the residents that are out on the front line. Uh, it's Mark again. I'll just make a couple of quick comments. So first of all, thanks to Lori and Jan and her staff who are playing a silent but giant Jenga game every day trying to keep the schedule up and running. Um, you know, it, it sounds simple. It's not. Uh, we have a significant number of faculty, residents, and hospital staff who are in quarantine after returning from travel. And those numbers go up and down. Um, the, we have a number of residents, or one resident who's stuck overseas, who's likely not coming back, who is from overseas originally. Uh, and, and the redeployment plan that Laurie just outlined is being developed right now by postgrad. But essentially, um, one of the things that will occur um, if this gets as bad as it's likely to get is that residents from other disciplines that are relatively underutilized at the moment, um, for example, surgery, um, will be uh, redeployed to help and not necessarily in medicine, but in one of the core disciplines, medicine, um, uh, ICU or the emergency department based on need. But again, just to reiterate what Barry and Alistair have said, that uh, you know, faculty will be required to step into roles that faculty would not normally be um, working in. And that doesn't mean if I'm a hematologist that my role is going to be confined to hematology. It means that my role is going to fall back to GIM. Unfortunately, that's where we're heading with this. Um, so uh, we're going to open it up for questions now. Oh, I, before that, Dominic, Dominic Merch is on the line. Dominic, do you have anything that you want to add from the uh, infection control perspective? Yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, probably just a, a quick update for everyone where we are at in terms of what the current pol policy or recommendations are in terms of which masks or respirator to use under which circumstances. This is probably the area we get most questions on. And as you're all well aware, uh, probably the federal government always, or the federal public health agency always recommended contact droplet precautions for management of COVID-19 patients. Um, Ontario chose a different approach first, uh, following the uh, precautionary principle and recommended a 95 that was reverted, um, I think it's roughly 10 days ago, time is flying by. Um, so the current recommendation is drop the contact, which means um, gloves, gown, mask, and the visor or goggles for contact with COVID-19 patients. If you're um, doing any aerosol generating medical procedures, it's an N95 respirator. Um, at HHS, we move to universal masking in the ED. The rationale there being that they see probably somewhere between 50 and 70% of the patients that they see currently are in contact droplet precautions. So A, it makes it easier for them in terms of donning and doffing all the time. At the same time, we can reduce our use in masks and uh, um, also face shields. So it was a win-win situation, and that's the first area where we implemented what's referred to as extended use of PPE, which is something we all need to learn how to do it moving forward because we will not have enough PPE to use one set for every patient contact. And at HHS, there's, I, I think it's out there now, or it, will, or it will follow in the next few hours, some educational material on how to either reuse N95 respirators or um, how to uh, apply the extended use and under which circumstances this is appropriate. This being said, we need to work with each area in more detail how it would look like in a specific setting, having the COVID-19 cohort wards uh, on the top of our list, of course. I just wanted to give that, that quick overview. There might be more detailed questions around that, but just to lay out the landscape where we are at currently. Thank you, Dominic. Okay, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, we have 220 people online, so um, there's going to be some jockeying for uh, attention, but if someone has a question, please just unmute yourself, identify who you are, and then at, direct your question to one of the speakers or to someone else on the line, please. 
So a question, Sam Holbrook here. Uh, one of our issues with so many people being off and potentially some of us going off with uh, with uh, symptoms was can we turn around the testing uh, faster for uh, key staff if we're looking like more and more that we're very essential services. So uh, I don't know if Zane is on, but could Dominic or Zane or someone ID comment on can we uh, can we ramp up the uh, uh, testing for necessary staff so that we can find out negatives, for example, much faster? So we, we are at the four to six hours range with our PCR for patients and the same for healthcare workers. Um, it's a new process that uh, healthcare workers now, at least for HHS, not true. I think San Jose needs maybe a day or more. Saint can comment on that that employee health would send people to the uh, urgent care center to get the testing done there. And then it's on the same day that you get the result back. I share your concern. And uh, the reason why we came up with that was that public health has roughly a five to six day backlog at this point. So if you get tested today, you will know by the weekend, maybe whether you're positive or not. And um, as, as you said, it's essential that for staff, we know that as quickly as possible. So once they feel better, they can come right back to work. Um, I just, uh, there's a chat thing here from um, Mickey Zeller who wanted to just mention the blood conservation, so, um, which is really important. So Mickey, could you unmute yourself and just make a quick comment on blood conservation? We can't hear you if you're speaking right now. Okay, how about now? Can you hear me now? Hello? Yes, we can hear you now. Yes, we oh, can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Canadian Blood Services is in green phase right now, which means we are meeting current targets and there's been a tremendous public response um, to the need for blood, but this is going to get more and more difficult as more and more people are quarantined. We're going to have less sites where we'll be able to collect from um, less frontline workers to collect blood. So we're going to go into shortage. There's going to be some really difficult decisions to be made. We have sent out some memos about what the different phases look like, and we will be continuously updating all of the end users. So everyone out there who's using blood product on uh, what the targets are going to be. And if you're outside those targets, you may or may not get blood for your product, or you may I get a question or a conversation with, with someone like me or someone from the blood bank. So we're gonna be having to make some very difficult decisions. And I also wanted to put a plug out there. I know there's a lot of people who like medical students who wanna contribute or people who are saying to you, what can we do? Well, maybe not this week or next week, but in three, four, five, six weeks from now, if people can go and donate blood, um, they're not accepting walk-ins at CBS so that we can respect physical distancing, but it's gonna be incredibly important to supporting everybody at our hospital hospitals um, to make sure that we have enough blood and that we're doing a really good job of judiciously using each precious product. And that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Thanks, Mickey. There's two chat comments here, probably both best for Dominic. Um, uh, so Dominic, if I can ask you a question. Uh, the first is, are we going to continue to isolate for MRSA? And the second is, what is the sensitivity of the swabs? So MRSA, um... We, we just run into a flu outbreak at the general. Uh, reality is just because of COVID, the other things do not stop from happening. And we don't necessarily need an uptick in MRSA bacteremias at the same time. Um, the main issue currently in terms of PP, and I guess that's where the question is coming from, is not gowns and gloves, it's masks, respirators. Um, so we, we aren't forced at this point to lower our standard of care in terms of MRSA or VRE patients. This being said, if um, we are unable to, to provide enough gowns, washable gowns, then at some point we may need to drop that. We will probably not make a difference, well, we can't make a difference on, for COVID, uh, COVID patients anyways, there will be a drop of contact. So it's those patients who will be negative uh, where it will make a difference whether they are MRSA positive or not. And for now, yes, we will continue 
uh, gowns are not an issue and gloves are not an issue at this point of time. Dominic, can you also comment on the sensitivity of the diagnostic test? Um, I, I always hear that it's 60 to 70 percent sensitive, which is mostly based, at least that's my understanding, not sure whether one of our microbiologists is on, on the call, mostly based on the data from China where they had a, at least in the beginning, quite inferior um, assay, which got better over time, but they had quality issues, probably also sample, sampling issues there. Um, our expectation is that it's much, much higher than that. There's a certain risk that in severely sick patients, but that's coming from, uh, from SARS data, that an MPS may be negative in someone who only has um, like a pulmonary infection at this point of time. And that's why in patients who present with the typical picture of ground glass, you don't have an, a, another uh, alternative diagnosis, the NPS was negative that we emphasized that we need a sputum, an ETA or, or a BAL, depending on whether the patient is intubated or not, um, to definitely rule out COVID-19. So that's probably where we have a certain lack um, in, in terms of sensitivity. Uh, some of you may have heard about the case in, in North York, which was one of those examples. NPS was negative. They had a very high suspicion that it is COVID, tested with an ETA 48 hours later and the ETA was positive. Thank you. Um, other questions? Hi, Mark. It's Amna. Um, I was going to ask a question from a staffing point of view. I know we mentioned the post grad is planning to, when things get busy, lean on other specialty residents such as surgery. My question was sort of the thought of um, uh, leaning on subspecialty residents within medicine, such as hematology or rheumatology, et cetera, um, A, to sort of help out when things get busy. And my second question was for some of those subspecialty residents, in fact, most of them have done their Royal College in internal medicine and do have independent license. Have we thought about perhaps using some of those fellows as even uh, primary MRP um, uh, because they have an independent license, even if they don't directly have admitting privileges? For sure we have. And maybe, Laurie, do you want to make a comment on that? You have to unmute yourself if you're talking, Laurie. I missed the first part of Amnes, the first part of the question. Um, the second part I heard was about fellows who are already uh, passed the Royal College examinations. It was just redeploying the subspecialty residents in medicine. In general. Yes. Uh, yes, we, we will have we will have capacity to to use the residents uh, who are in pro residency programs and uh, in subspecialties and including GIM. We will be able to redeploy them back to clinical services. That will be um, stated quite clearly in the documents from post-grad and otherwise. So that's not the first line. I think our first line for fellows will be from uh, the GIM pool and from there perhaps subspecialty, but that's just sort of uh, something we're starting to work on now. Yeah, so as I understand it, the first line will be just internal redeployment of, of the PGY ones to threes, which we're doing right now. Um, there was a lot of documentation on this on that humongous email I sent out yesterday, which I apologize for. Um, the second level is then um, the GIM residents, the PGY fours and fives. The third level is then redeploying the subspecialty residents who can be redeployed. The problem, of course, is that regular care continues. So um, we can't redeploy them all because there's still going to be patients who require regular hospital care. So there's being, uh, Dr. Wasi has put it putting a vast amount of time into working on this with many others to make sure that we you know, we, we do this in a way that, that allows us to keep the wheels on the system while reflecting the fact that the system has grown many more wheels. Uh, Barry or Alistair, do you want to make any comments about that? Alistair, do you want to say? I, I, I don't think so, Mark. I think it's pretty clear. Okay, thanks. Uh, special PD, I can comment, Mark, um, Mira Luthra. Absolutely, yeah, please. 
Um, so just that we have received the redeployment document from Parveen and our directive is to send back the names of our residents and the capacity that they have to work in various settings. In my case, I would say mostly in the medicine side as opposed to ICU maybe. Uh, but uh, certainly I'm going to be speaking with my residents to make them aware that if the need arises that they may be redeployed. And I think all the programs are supportive of this in the crisis situation. Excellent. Um, other comments or questions from others on the line? We're up to 221 people now. Uh, hello. Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, this is Ali Hersey Emerge. Um, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Right. So I, I heard, I think, from Alistair that uh, people, in terms of capacity, people will actually be staying down in Emerge till their um, COVID status is determined by, by, I guess, the NP swap. And if there is a backup, we're talking about days now, um, and we don't have much negative pressure rooms downstairs and or HEPA filters, how is that actually going to work? So I, I think I, I take this question. And I, yes, public health is behind several days. Um, our own lab isn't. We get the results within six hours at HHS, Sancho's four hours because it's, it's in the same building. So we can deal with that. I think the only exception to that rule, as I mentioned, is if you need a sputum or ETA because you have a very high suspicion and the NPS comes back negative, then you need to wait until the public health lab reports the result because sputum and ETA at this very point of time are still sent to the public health lab. I would point out that uh, for patients who are known positive who, re who have shown up in urgent care, uh, as long as we still have capacity on the COVID wards, they'll be able to uh, hopefully uh, bypass the ED, go straight to the ward for admission. So we, you know, we won't be backing you up with people uh, referred um, uh, as symptomatic from the community already known to be positive. Hi, it's Alistair here. Um, so just also to answer that question for St. Joe's, as of March 30th, the virology lab will go 24 seven with four hour turnaround. Uh, we intend, uh, and I think this is public knowledge now, <laughs> it is now, uh, to expand the emergency department into, into the redeveloping former fracture clinic area to give us the capacity. But the intention of the hospital is that except for the critically ill, no one will exit the doors of the emergency department onto the wards of the hospital until we know their COVID status. Hi, um, it's Rebecca Amer here from Respirology at St. Joe's. Um, and um, I appreciate the opportunity to ask a question and I, I'm gonna direct this towards Dominic, um, if that's all right. Um, so when we expect to see surging patient volumes um, at week four, um, we're a few weeks, uh, weeks away from that, we're gonna have to anticipate that we're gonna be seeing patients coming in with fulminant hypoxic respiratory failure. and um, I'm a little concerned um, with the fact that they may come in with an ARDS like picture um, and have a negative NPS swab. Um, and then these patients may be released into critical care or up on the ward, probably to critical care if they're in hypoxic respiratory failure. And if, if we're still suspicious that, you know, that this could be compatible with COVID, um, it's sort of incongruent with what we've been told about um, the policy on doing bronchoscopies. So our service, um, you know, was told to be quite judicious with who we decide to bronch, which totally makes sense. And getting sputum in these patients spontaneously is often challenging. So my concern is that if, if we do have negative swabs in patients with fulminant respiratory failure, um, they go up to the ward and we're still suspicious. What, you know, obviously we're going to have to get sampling at some point and how should we expect to manage that patient cohort? I, I guess I, will, I, will, I would love to have a perfect solution for this. I think that's the conundrum we are currently in. A, we cannot get a student in those patients. B, they are not, well, 
if they are as severely sick, given that we will not do any non-invasive ventilation, most likely they will be in the ICU, most likely they will be intubated and we get an ETA, but then we have to wait, yeah, unless we get an alternative diagnosis or it becomes clear that it must be something else, but even the something else doesn't rule out COVID-19. So the clinical judgment kicks in at that point of time. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately at this point, we don't have the perfect solution in having a test that's 100% sensitive in every patient. We only have to do it once. Um, I would say that for the routine patient who comes in not as severely sick with mostly upper respiratory tract infections, we are very confident that the NPS is all we need. If we can get a sputum, great. If not, the NPS is negative and optimally showing another virus. I think then we can, we can settle on this not being COVID-19. In terms of management, it doesn't change an awful lot, right? If you have a patient with a respiratory viral infection, the patient is in contact droplet. If the patient has COVID-19, the patient is in contact droplet. So you would still, use the protection you need, uh, even if you're not entirely sure whether the patient is indeed COVID-19 positive or whether you're only suspicious or whether it's another vi uh, respiratory virus the patient may have. Hi, uh, sorry, just if I can ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to follow up on that point, uh, maybe to further Rebecca's point uh, for Dominic or anyone else, there is, an, I'd say, not a small group of patients admitted to medicine on any given day that, um, that present with respiratory illness that we end up using that clinical judgment uh, to decide. And oftentimes, it, it is in the setting of high uncertainty. And we're making decisions about whether it's a COPD exacerbation or a viral uh, infection or a bacterial pneumonia in a context where the MPS is negative, uh, but we say sometimes, well, maybe it's a virus that we don't detect with our swab, uh, or we say, well, maybe it's bacterial and we treat empirically. Um, and so I, I, I guess just to further that point, um, are we comfortable uh, that if a patient has a negative MPS, but they clearly have an acute respiratory decompensation, um, are we comfortable making the assumption that it's something else that we oftentimes do? So I would say if you have the um, decompensation that you mentioned, um, and it's not your typical heart failure picture, or you're concerned that it may be an infection and you have a negative NPS, you may not be entirely sure, and you may decide to leave the patient and drop the contact precautions just to make sure. And we will have probably many of those patients because in these days, everyone will want to err on the side of caution. We had a couple of cases in the ICU that we discussed today where the ETA is still pending, but we have an alternative diagnosis of very low level of suspicion where you can say it's probably appropriate to take them out, but these really are case by case decisions and the overarching principle will be we err on the side of caution and rather leave someone in the contact than taking them out just to make sure, just in case. And I think there's nothing we can do to avoid that from happening because we know we don't have 100% um, safety in any decisions we make. That's true always in medicine, but given the current situation, this may have more impact on your clinical decision making than it would have had three months ago. That's, that's really good to know. And I think maybe it would be important to echo through our group to make sure that people keep that in mind. And it's a change of practice that we're going to have to adopt that. Um, of course, that function, if I could just, I'm just going to ask it. Um, and then, uh, then Roman, and then I think it looks like somebody Craig was next or someone else. So <clears throat> um, question for, Dominic or Barry or Alistair, someone's asked if they have their own N95 masks at home, can they use them in the hospital if the hospital supply is getting low? Whoever, go ahead, Dominic. It, it looks like nobody else wants, wants to take this question, so. Well, Alistair's here too, but you answer first, Dominic. <laughs> okay, uh, let me know if you disagree. Um, uh -huh. 
if you have a stock of N95 at home, I would highly recommend to donate them back to the hospital. At this point of time, we try to get as much um, masks and respirators in as possible from the community and have been quite successful in doing so. So that would be probably the most ethical approach to that rather than keep them just for yourself and use it for themselves once you, once you need them. Yes, I totally agree with Dominic. Mark, uh, uh, Roman, Jeff, Jeff White. wants to ask a question, then we'll go back to the open this mic. This is Jeff White. Oh, Jeff, can okay, you hear Jeff, me? Jeff, go first, then Roman. Jeff, go ahead. I just, you know, I, I know this is a crisis, but there's also opportunity here, and I wonder about the opportunities for addressing some simple research questions around COVID-19. We will have an onslaught of patients with confirmed or suspected disease, and we have an opportunity here to determine, for example, I've been in contact with physicians from China and uh, Italy and South Korea, and loss of smell is supposedly one of the early uh, symptoms of COVID-19. We could be systematically asking our patients about that. Also, D-dimer has been proposed as a biomarker to identify patients at high risk, and we could be systematically evaluating that. Do we have opportunities for research? Uh, I know in Vancouver, they've uh, allowing research projects to go ahead without necessarily getting consent right from the get-go. Are there these opportunities in Hamilton? So Jeff, I would say I have signed off on an immense number of COVID-19 research proposals over the last two weeks from um, uh, things in uh, the emergency department has put forward a couple. There's a bunch in the basic science laboratories. And, and the other thing that's happened very, very quickly is that funding has become available. So I believe, for example, that there's a large randomized control trial um, that CIHR funded already running uh, with sites in Hamilton. So I think the answer to that is yes. Um, and, and, and uh, Mark, if I could just butt in there for a bit, yeah. it's Sonia. Um, and Jeff and others may have seen, I think some other co-investigators are on the call too, Dominic as well. Um, the PHRI has put together a randomized trial um, really rapidly over the past weekend, and um, PHRI has donated funds to get it started. So this would be an RCT uh, comparing azithromycin and chloroquine to usual care, both in the outpatients to prevent uh, admission to hospital and in inpatients who are COVID positive to prevent ICU admission and death. So we will be kind of reaching out to many of you in the circle of care and also in community assessment centers to support this randomized trial. And Jeff, there is an opportunity to build in some sub-studies that, that are underway. May I add to that, please? Uh, it's Deborah Cook speaking. Can you guys, can I? Yes, Deborah, go ahead? Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so in addition to um, the great uh, trial that Sonia has spoken about, there's uh, a long standing preparation of uh, two observational studies of hospital based and ICU based patients uh, with COVID 19. Um, that uh, one of which is funded, one of which isn't, which uh, has started. And then the trials group for the acute lung injury ARDS patient. Um, there is also another international trial that's uh, going on. There's four or five patients randomized uh, in Canada. And uh, a second Canadian critical care trials group, again, um, focused on the most seriously ill with ALI, ARDS, and finally, uh, or not, not that this is the only trial, but there's a very big um, similarly adaptive design by the World Health Organization. And there's been a call from the federal government, I've been involved as a scientific advisor, um, to try to encourage people to um, collaborate whenever possible so that we don't have you know, a small number of 100 patient RCTs, but um, try to have, uh, solidarity around 
um, larger trials with tighter confidence limits around whatever is being observed for, for the relevant outcomes. And finally, there's a pre-prophylaxis um, exposure RCT that's uh, being designed uh, focused on uh, people before they are sick but after exposure. And uh, as probably you all know about some of the other healthcare worker RCTs going on. So I, I think Canada has uh, risen to the occasion very incredibly to uh, do randomized trials and, and create registries with waived consent and the acknowledging that research is a public good and we, we need to collect data so that uh, we can know what's going on and do experiments. Thanks, Devin. I just want to Deb, put together a document outlining some of the principles around this over the weekend that's been shared with the leadership of the hospitals and the university, I think will help to guide us through this process. I'm going to um, ask, Roman has been waiting patiently, so Roman, you can go next. And then I see Rebecca, Chris, you've got your hand up. I'll, I'll get you next after Roman. Um, I want to comment on something I've spoken to Alistair already, which is um, if Barry's number are even half true, I hope they were weekly numbers, but it sounds very that they were daily numbers. We could expect five to 10, say, admissions a day to intensive care with similar uh, number of intubations. Now, we know that intubations are time when uh, transmission occurs most easily and um, contamination of healthcare workers may occur as well. I watched um, uh, movies, <laughs> videos from Wuhan, and it was quite clear that in a large hospital, they had a intubation squad, uh, which was carrying its own equipment, uh, which was meticulously um, prepared in terms of protective equipment, and which took away the uh, most um, likely moments of care during which contamination of healthcare personnel were to occur. Um, I would like to call upon our, our leaderships in hospital to organize uh, groups like that. They will be busy, unfortunately, if those numbers which uh, Barry uh, presented are, are correct. And this would dramatically decrease the risk of, um, of infection and contamination. Yeah, thanks Roman. Uh, you're absolutely correct. And we're, we're uh, certainly at HHS, we're actively uh, trying to figure out exactly what that airway management team will look like. Uh, and expecting help from our anesthesia colleagues as well as ED and critical care, the folks who actually know how to do this properly. Um, and, and so we're, we're very much aware and, and looking to, to have a team uh, like literally 24 seven. And, and the, the issue is not only to intubate, but it's also to have protective equipment training and supply, which would keep those people in absolute um, safety as, as, um, as the Chinese were demonstrating. Uh, they instituted in Singapore and I believe they have no one single healthcare worker um, infection related to intubations, which was quite remarkable. Agreed. Also, do you want to make a comment on St. Joe's? Can you hear me? Yes, but we, <laughs> if we are yeah. mute, we cannot answer. Yeah, so I, I, I... I'm not leading this since it's, uh, I'm not the critical care lead, but my understanding uh, is that uh, the planning is, per, is well advanced for an intubation team. Uh, Mark Soft would know more about it. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca's had her hand up patiently for a while. Rebecca, do you want to have a question? Very briefly. Um, here in KW, we're seeing a fair share of uh, vented COVID patients already. Um, with acute lung injury, and I'm wondering how to get a hold of or how to participate in the studies that are happening. I know that through Paul Hoshek, we participated in a number of them in the past, but I think that we will have patients to register in some of these trials. Fantastic. Be in touch. Yeah, so I think Rebecca, Deb, should uh, maybe Dr. Cook and Dr. Cruz could get in touch with one another both to follow up on that. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes, so um, could I just open it up for anyone else who has uh, questions from the floor? Hi there, it's Craig. Um, I just wanted to know, we seem to have a standardized approach where everyone who's admitted through the ED gets held there um, until their status is known. 
is there a coordinated effort for those of us who work on on services that, I mean, for example, ICU or sorry, CCU at the general and ICU at the general, and I'm sure other services have, you know, CCU has 80% of our patients come not through our eMERGE. They come from the field directly or they come from uh, other hospitals. Um, and I'm sure there's lots of other regional programs that people are on the line that represent that um, I'm not sure where to house these folks when they don't actually come through the eMERGE. Greg, it's Barry for uh, HHS. I, I think it would be foolish of me to, to tell you I know the answer to that. Uh, there is, a, as, as I, you probably are well aware, um, a critical care working group. Uh, and um, I, I think it would be smart if I, if I left that for Corey and, and that group rather than me try and answer that. All um, right. Uh, yeah, what, time for one more question. We've got uh, two more minutes, so whoever just speak. Ma Dr. Larche, go ahead. Okay, thank you. It's Maggie Larche here. For those of us who, who have not done internal medicine for a while, but are very willing to help, is there um, opportunity to start relearning some techniques such as arterial lines and things like that that may be useful when we're on the wards? For example, could we use the simulation center? That's a great question. So uh, that's a great question. Um, I'll ask if Roman, Roman, are you still on the line? Could you make some comments about your uh, your plan to provide primers for people who are coming back in internal medicine for a while? And then secondarily, I think the simulation center is closed at the moment. But that's something, Maggie that, or Dr. Larshay, I'll, I'll take forward because I think it's that's something we hadn't even thought about, but is a valuable question to ask. Um, so Roman, do you want to make a comment? Yes, uh, two comments, uh, both with full declaration of conflict of interest. Uh, for good or for bad, Maggie, we distributed today uh, boxes of McMaster Textbook of Medicine to every CTU in the city, and it's free to take by anybody who wants it. So that's number one. And number two, one of your colleagues asked exactly this question. And as of yesterday, we made a, a small group with Agbar Panjo. Um, two senior uh, residents, uh, SMRs, and myself. And our goal is to produce five minutes, um, uh, we call it refreshers, uh, for um, different, um, uh, different uh, acute medical issues. We, we actually started of how to gown and, and take the gown off and mask and gloves and so forth. The next step would be how to deal with chest pain. The next would be DKA. The next would be COPD, and it's directed precisely at, at uh, seasoned physicians, so to speak, uh, who didn't practice, who, who heard it all in the past, but who didn't practice it for last few years. And uh, that those um, videos will, will appear on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, I don't think they take away, um, they, they substitute for hands-on experience. Uh, one issue which I heard floating around was for for such physicians to join rounds on in ICU or in CCU and starts to take um, a, you know more more practical approach, uh, including opportunities for for remuneration with it. Thank you. At our, at our site, one of the first things we've done is created COVID-specific uh, power plans to help out with the COVID specific population for physicians who have not done inpatient medicine for some time. It's, it's laid out about as straightforwardly as possible, that being another sort of stumbling block for some folks who haven't done inpatients and uh, general medicine for a while. Just as a thought, I suppose you guys have probably already done that. Yeah, I, I would emphasize that w it's not our intention to, to, to throw somebody who really has lost uh, the, uh, you know, last did GIM 10 years ago uh, or more uh, into the pit by themselves. We will obviously do our very best to make sure that people are adequately supported uh, with our residents, uh, colleagues, and or a, a, a very competent um, GIM colleague. And, and again, I think one thing not to forget is that you're not going to be there by yourself, as Barry just said. And, you know, if, if you have a question of uh, I'll use hematology as an example because I'm familiar with that uh, hematology and it, it, don't don't waste 20 minutes of your time trying to sort out something that I can answer in one second. You know, we're all going to be 
severely discombobulated by this, reach out to the great group of colleagues that we have around who are extremely um, willing to help uh, each other in particular in areas in which we aren't very familiar. Um, we're, we're at six o'clock there, uh, so I, I will actually draw the meeting to a close. I know that people have got a lot of, um, a lot of other things to do. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, we are intending to uh, pr produce this as a YouTube video or as a podcast for people who couldn't join us today. Um, I'd again, like to just thank everybody in advance for your efforts for, that are going to come and for helping us to prepare for this. We've, we've had a lot of lead time uh, due to the sacrifice of people in China, Italy, Spain, and, and elsewhere. And, and we will go into this with a lot more planning and preparation than they unfortunately did. And, and to a very large extent, I think a lot more preparation than some of our friends in um, New York are going through right now. So and, and I think we'll, we, we will come out of this probably stronger than they will simply because we've had time to plan. I'll just ask Barry and Alistair if they had any last minute um, comments or questions that they wanted uh, to, uh, to raise. Alistair, none from me. Okay. Barry, anything? Uh, no, uh, just that I, um, I did uh, circulate through the heads of service today uh, an inventory request of, of people's uh, um, skill sets, and I would, uh, would ask that you please um, give us your honest assessment of your skill set uh, to your head of service, and, and then it will come up to, uh, to me. I have to, uh, I have to provide that to Dr. Stacy uh, by uh, Friday latest. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Oh, Alistair here. I'd like to thank everybody on the phone call who I ranked and who didn't give me any blowback. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody, and thanks for participating both with questions and also chat. Um, someone's asked, can we set up an online community? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. You know, there's been a tremendous amount of organic growth of resources through the course of this. And, you know, if you have the energy, please, uh, please do that. Um, I've got a bunch of uh, other for, uh, literature-based research projects going on with medical students. There's lots of people around right now who are interested in helping us with this problem at all different levels. So thanks very much, everybody. Um, we'll probably plan on doing this at some point in the future, again, just to make sure everybody's up to speed. Uh, and I will continue to send out the updates. I'm going to try to send them every other day to reduce the uh, blast of emails everyone's getting. Thank you very much. Bye now.